So we're meeting today talking about nuclear chemistry and we're in the second portion of the program. Uh, yesterday we talked about the history of radioactivity or the history of this phenomenon of atoms spontaneously giving off either particles and or energy because uh, they have something wrong in their nucleus. And that's what a radioactive element is. It's an element that has instability, instability inside their nucleus for four basic reasons. One of the reasons was um, that it had too many neutrons. And for what we understand is that neutrons in the nucleus somehow help stabilize protons. Think about protons being really small, right? And a lot of them are in a close proximity. What keeps the protons together is the strongest force in nature. And believe it or not, with a lack of creativity, scientists call that the strong force. Now think about positive and positives, but what helps buffer that we think are the neutrons. So neutrons do that. And we know that because particles that try to lower the proton number have to be emitted with neutrons. Any case, so we talked about beta emission. The second thing we talked about was um, positron emission. Nuclei, they have two less neutrons or some kind of ratio of neutrons to protons that's healthy and stable. And if you have the wrong number, what's the, the, the nucleus of that atom is going to want to change itself to get stable, okay? And so having too many neutrons and two less for the protons in the nucleus causes instability, okay? And then we talked about uh, overcrowding the nucleus, having too many protons, and that too many protons makes every single isotope, every version of every atom unstable in the nucleus because, well, too many positives in a small area coulombically make it very difficult to keep the nucleus from just breaking apart. And we call that energy that keeps a nucleus together, believe it or not, binding energy, okay? And that changing of binding energy is where nuclear reactions energies come from, okay? So that binding energy is the, is the basis, the change of that binding energy is the basis of all nuclear reactions, fission, fusion, the H-bomb or the atomic bomb that we as the United States dropped on um, um, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, Japan in World War II, they were about changes in that binding energy. And because the strongest force in nature is based upon keeping positives together in a nucleus, changes of those strongest force in nature gives us the greatest amount of energy changes in these reactions, which are not chemical reactions. These are nuclear reactions. We're not talking about electrons attracting a nucleus or being shared or transferred. We're talking about how well the atom can stick together. That's important. So in any case, I'm going to share my screen and we're going to go um, to uh, the uh, presentation that I was working with yesterday and hopefully I can get there. And I'm either, it's either AP Bio or not. Let's see here. Okay, cool. And we're going to get to the relativistic heavy ion collider. All right. So any case, let's present from this portion of this program. Uh, present. And here we go. All right. So which element has no known state? I still, I asked you guys to do this part. Obviously it gives you the answers. So I don't know who did it or who didn't do it, but I'm just gonna go through it anyway and talk over it. How do you know which element has no known stable isotope? How do I know that there is no version of that element that is not stable? We know that carbon 14 is radioactive. It's a beta emitter, okay? Um, why? Because it has two more neutrons that it's supposed to makes it unstable. So it changes this neutron number. But we're talking about, we know that carbon-12 is stable. It has a good ratio of neutrons to protons. We're talking about, so in the case of carbon, um, it does have a stable isotope. But we're talking about which one of these has no unstable, uh, no known stable isotope. Every version of that element every one with different number of neutrons is unstable. Well, that's where you have the overcrowding of the nucleus. We're looking for elements beyond atomic number 83. And because of having too many protons, it destabilizes that nucleus, it wants to change. So this is a question of recognizing the fact that you had to give me an element that was beyond atomic number 83, and that is polonium, which was discovered uh, or at least uh, I would say um, yeah, it was discovered and it was discovered because the Madame Curie or Marie Curie um, knew it was radioactive, but it had different reactivity in this compound. And so she found a chemical way to separate it. And so she identified this new element by its unique reactivity. And she named it after where she came from, Poland. 
All right, so polonium is the only element with an atomic number greater than 83. Okay, which type of radiation, okay, when passed through two electrically charged plates would deflect toward the positive? Well, that must be a particle that's negative. And as you should know, the beta particle is negative. It really is a high energy electron that weirdly enough comes out of the nucleus. Why? Because a, um, a neutron, which is neutral, is really made up of quarks, okay? We'll talk about, well, they're made, made up of, you want to make it very simplified, make, made up of a, a positive and negative particle that makes it neutral. So it gets rid of the negative particle that makes it neutral and the electron. In truth, there is a neutrino that comes off, all right? And we call that the weak force, actually, uh, how well that can occur. And again, there's a lot of different things, a lot of layers of more theories involved in all of this. And I'm just touching the surface, okay? Uh, I'm a chemist, not a physicist, but any case, I'll do my best. So it looks like I um, somehow showed all the answers here. I'm not sure what happened here, but um, any case, yeah. So that's the beta particle. Okay, number three, in electrical field, which animation, okay, particle or, you know, radiation is deflecting toward the negative. That's the one that's positive. And the alpha particle is a helium nucleus, two protons, two neutrons. We can't give off protons without neutrons because it stabilizes them, right? Um, and it's an alpha particle and it's positively charged. It's a heavy, slow particle that, you know, doesn't penetrate us, doesn't penetrate the skin. It's not a mutagen. We use it in smoke detectors. Which particle is given off when uh, P32 undergoes a transmutation reaction. Okay, now you say, well, how do I know this one? Well, we could go to the periodic table and look at phosphorus. And we can see phosphorus, okay, has a average isotopic mass of 31. If you go to your reference table, you'll see that the number for phosphorus rounds to 31. So having one more neutron, you should be able to figure out that's a beta decay. And that's how that works. Or if you don't want to know and understand it, go to table on N. Na, 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 hey, 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 last table for Regents Chemistry. And table N will show you the type of emission, okay? It's a B negative, all right? So if I go to table N here, okay, and hopefully it opens up. Of course it doesn't, bad Grodsky, but uh, going back to reality, table N, okay, and we could go back there a couple different ways. I, I should just link it back. But there's table N right here, and I don't have phosphorus shown, but you can see that if you scroll down, you'll see it. These elements or these nucleotides of selected radioisotopes, okay, give their decay mode. And if you go to table O, they show that B negative is a beta particle, B positive is a positron, and this is an alpha particle. So you, all you had to do there, party people, was go to um, table N in your reference table. Okay, and let's continue on our little discussion. So we went through here, 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 and now we're on to the next page. Number seven, here is a nuclear equation. These are nuclear equations that the, the chemistry, New York State Regents loves for you to fill out. And they're very simple because they use a law of conservation of mass and the law of conservation of charge. Okay, top number is the mass number. So 234 plus what? So all the numbers, all the mass numbers of all the particles that are produced from this um, nuclear reaction, not chemical, we're looking at the changes of the nucleus here, must equal all the mass numbers on the top of the reactant side. So 234 equals 234 plus zero. So we're looking for a particle with a mass theoretically zero. And look at this, 92 plus what number equals 91? Negative one. So party people, that negative one, okay, zero over negative one is a beta particle. How do I know? If I go to table O and I don't dare click on that because that link needs to be fixed, okay, I will see that a zero to a negative one, or, and again, I'll draw it, okay, because I can. So if I was to draw, all right, and I thought I could draw because I was sharing. All right, uh, pointer, mm -hmm, let's see here, uh, annotate, here we go. So if I draw a zero and a negative one, and I go to table O, I will find a particle that looks like that, okay? And that particle with a theoretical mass of zero and a charge of negative one is a beta particle and written like B negative. So table O will show you that, and hey, that's beta emission. Hey, something by itself, this is called natural transmutation, gives off a beta particle, which is right here. 
and becomes, transmutates into a brand new nucleus that's more stable, right? And notice what happens. The proton number increased. How'd that happen? With the mass staying the same. Hey, a neutron had to become a proton to, to decrease the neutron to proton ratio to make it more stable, okay? And emitted a high speed electron and a neutrino, okay? For those that will yell at me if I don't mention that. Okay, so that's how that goes. All right, so let's bring back the mouse. All right, so that's why that's a beta particle. And you, uh, if that was listed in table N, you could have done it that way. All right, moving on. Number uh, eight, what is X? Okay, well, clearly X is a particle. Now notice 88 plus what is 90? So 88 plus what number is 90? Clearly party people, that's a two. All right, I can do this. So that would be a two right there. And then what number plus 228 is 234? Hey, that's four. So what particle has an atomic mass of four and atomic number of two? Hey, that's a helium nucleus, what we call an alpha particle. If you go to table O, it's listed like that. And that's why choice one is the answer. It's just that simple. We shouldn't have a problem with that. All right, moving on. Number nine. What's this particle? Well, if palladium gives off what we call a beta particle, what should this be? Okay, well, pretty sarn simple here. Okay, we're gonna have negative one plus what number equals? Remember, all the numbers on one side have to equal all the numbers on the other, sort of. And we'll get to those little uh, tiny differences. In nuclear equations, it works out. Okay, so negative one plus what? Well, that's gonna be a 92. And then zero plus what number is 234? Well, of course, that's 234. So if you notice, there's only one number with 234 on top, 92. And of course, when you do this on the regents level, make sure that you get the right um, symbol for the atomic number, 92 is uranium, okay? So that why, that's the reason why choice one is our answer. Yeah, maybe, there it is in all of its glory. Okay, so we'll clear all of those guys, and that should have been straightforward. Uh, number 10, as an atom of a radioisotope emits an alpha particle, its mass number of the atom does what? Okay, well, if a, a radioactive isotope emits an alpha particle, it's losing what? It's losing atomic four AMUs. Now I say AMUs because they're not grams, they're atomic mass units. They're a relative scale based on each other because a, a, a neutron any proton have about the same mass. They're not exactly the same, right? But they're close enough. We both give them one atomic mass unit, okay? And because an electron is 2,000 times or really 1,836 the size of a proton or neutron, okay, we can, we can just say 2,000 times smaller. It's insignificant. It gets to zero. So if you lose four nucleons, nucleons are things in a nucleus, they both have the same mass, four AMUs, the mass number of the atom has to, of course, decrease, okay? And then here's a great little question here, okay? In the natural, okay, in the natural, um, pin rename, okay, we'll just leave that there. Okay, in the natural decay of K37, now don't get lost in the sauce, K37 just means what? K37 just means that I have potassium with the mass of 37. Some people often think K37 would be the proton number. And remember, I'm doing this videos for the Regents Chem students as well. Uh, and maybe, maybe you'd fall for that too. So people get confused. Remember, we talk about an atom of, let's say, potassium, okay? Uh, we need to know what's the mass number because every single atom has another form of itself, meaning uh, potassium being uh, number 19, atomic number 19, okay? it has many forms of itself, which means it can have different number of what? Neutrons, which are isotopes, okay? So when you speak of an element, you must tell me what form you're talking about. Hey, I have carbon. I got the I carbon in the back truck, dude. You want some carbon? It's really cheap. It fell off a truck. I wanna give it to you, dude. And you're, you're gonna say to yourself, well, is it carbon 12, carbon 14, carbon 10? What kind of carbon are we talking about? All right, so you, I have to, Consider that. So any case, that just means that, and because they gave you the K party people, we know that the what atomic number is implied. So what's the decay product? Well, 
Okay, a couple ways you can do this. You can go to table N, look up potassium 37, and say to yourself, what's the decay mode? Okay, or because you understand this, when we go to the reference table, okay, to the periodic table that I'm peering at, okay, I can see with my poor eyes here that potassium is normally 39. Okay, actually, the number I'm looking at is 39.0983. I'll just write that 39.09. My short term memory is gone at this height, 83. And we know that rounds off to 39. The reasoning we have a decimal place is because that's an average of all the isotopes of potassium using their relative abundances in nature. It's called a weighted average, right? We talked about that, done that. Classic regents level calculation. And because there's always one, there seemingly is always one, there's always gonna be some, so someone's gonna yell at me, there's always gonna be some contradiction somewhere, but most of the time there's one form of the element that's in greatest quantity. And because of that, which this number rounds to, gives you the isotope that's most prevalent in nature. Nature, and these are natural isotopes. These do not include synthetic ones. So in any case, so K39 is the stable form. 37 is below that. Ooh, when you have lower than uh, number of uh, neutrons and expected, you should understand that that must be a positron decay. What's a positron? Go to table O. And a positron is what? A B uh, positive. Or it's a zero E plus one. It's that anti-electron. It's the electron uh, antimatter of, of an electron. So it has the same mass but different charge. So we, we write that. Now, if you go to table O and look up positron, it'll give you that. So it's E, zero E plus one. And then we do the what? Do the math. It's so simple. Okay. And again, this is not a chemical reaction. This is a nuclear reaction. What number plus zero is 37? Hey, 37. So I'm left with the mass numbers here. Okay. What number plus one is 19? It's not 18, or is it? Okay, or is it 20? Okay, this is plus one. So yes, it is 18, my bad. So I, even I got it wrong. Okay, so 18. So the question is, I know the mass number is 37, but who is atomic number 18? Well, if you go to your periodic table, all right, and I hope we have some left. I know it's the end of the year, so your periodic tables could be all gone. Okay, argon, yes. So um, AR is atomic number 18, and that is, of course, your answer. And that's where we get our answers from. And I'm probably going to have some work that I showed here that's going to come in here. Yeah. So um, kind of confusing if I do that. So if I clear all that and you get that, clear all my drawings. Okay. So you get that. All right. And hopefully you do. And uh, you should have been through that. All right. Now, before I continue, uh, I want to step back and show you a pretty cool video. Uh, I showed you this guy when he brought um, um, rubidium, okay, the most reactive uh, alkali metal, and reacted with fluorine. Remember that guy that, okay, was uh, uh, lightning, uh, uh, loosening up the fluorine gas, and he made the an ionic reaction, and you guys expected the whole thing to blow up, and it was just a fla flash of light. I know. But this guy also mess, mess, uh, messes with something called a cloud chamber, okay? And so what a cloud chamber is, okay, if I could uh, just draw this for a second, is it's a cool way to show these types of emissions. So what a cloud chamber is, is what we have is we have a, a pan here, and we, we kind of fill it with, um, uh, well, we have alcohol, I would say, underneath in this pan here. So we use alcohol. And the reason why we use alcohol is alcohol requires a low temperature to um, actually um, freeze. Okay, people see alcohol doesn't freeze. Everything freezes except for hydrogen, right? Unless, well, hydrogen will freeze. Uh, so everything can freeze. Okay, so they use some kind of alcohol here. All right, now, what they do is they make it extremely cold. Okay, and one way to do that is have dry ice or sitting up below that. All right, okay, or in the chamber. It doesn't really matter. But what we do know is it's, we got some very, very cold alcohol, okay? And then you have basically um, air above it. And so this very cold alcohol, even though it's not boiling, is evaporating. Now, when it evaporates in the chamber, 
Okay, obviously it, it still evaporates. It's got some kind of vapor pressure and alcohols have extremely high vapor pressure. So even at cold temperatures, even though it's lower, it's still evaporating. Now, into the air above it, it's warm. So what's gonna happen is this gas, okay, is gonna become a liquid droplet, as we know it to be fog, right? You can't see usually gases, so you're gonna have liquid droplets. Now, a little bit of physics or chemistry here, liquid droplets become bigger droplets if they have a place to collect, okay? It's called a nucleation site. And the best way to talk about nucleation sites, it's like if you have a pan that's boiling of water, even though it's a different phase here, if you look at a pan of water, okay, it's seemingly the bubbles seem to come from the same spot. So if you have a pot of boiling water, the bubbles come from one spot. Now there's reason why that might happen is in your pot, although you may not be able to feel it uh, macroscopically, microscopically, there is a rough edge that kind of may stick out to give what? To give the, um, um, bubbles, the evaporating bubbles to collect into a bigger bubble. And once they're a bigger bubble, hey, they're more buoyant. Ah, the buoyant force, and they come to the surface. Uh, same thing when you drop ice cubes in soda. Why do bubbles appear? Because the ice, although it seems like it might be very smooth, has rough edges because each edge is a water molecule. And so dropping ice into carbonated beverage gives the CO2 a place to collect into a bigger bubble and rise to the surface. So in any case, what's cool about this is what we take a radioactive element, okay, that's gonna give uh, some type of beta, alpha, or gamma radiation, and we put that right in the chamber here. Of course, because the nucleus is unstable and they wanna get stable, they give off their particle for whatever the reasons we've talked about as nausea. And so as the particle moves across the chamber, it creates that particle, a place, okay, for the gas to become a liquid droplet. And what you see is you see um, like a fog, okay, deliver in the line that the particle is moving. Kind of like we call contrails on a jet engine in the sky. If you ever look at the jet sometime in the sky and you see um, uh, that fog, it's the same reasoning that fog emits from the jet engine. You can see those contrails, okay? So that's what we do, it's called a, it's called a chamber. So uh, he's gonna go through his little thing and we're gonna watch uh, alpha, beta, and some gamma emission if it can pop up. It's pretty cool. So I'm gonna go back and show you that to make it more sense of this, okay? All right, uh, and I'm gonna go back. I forgot what slide it is, so just give me a chance here. Here it is, okay. I'm gonna pull out my headphone so you can actually hear it and we can do this. All right, so here we go. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right, so yeah, unfortunately, okay. All right, so any case, here we go. So you're you're looking at contrail. So you're looking actually at the at the cloud chamber. Okay, and that cloud chamber is giving you every time you see a line appearing, okay, that's giving you some particle, some background radiation that's actually going through the cloud chamber before the scientist puts something in there. So let's look at that again. There's those lines, those long so lines are gamma radiation. Of the recording for the Christmas lectures, uh, but I thought I'd take an opportunity to point this out because it's so beautiful. This is a really stunning cloud chamber, and the tracks that you can see here show just the natural radiation in the atmosphere around us. So if we actually have a look in here, you can see sometimes there are, there are thicker tracks, which are big, heavy alpha particles. Sometimes there are little wispy ones, which are beta particles. But all of these, they're all working in the same way. So the atmosphere in here contains a lot of vapor of alcohol. And it's sort of more than it should have. And when these charged particles fire through the atmosphere in here, they cause little droplets to form. And those are the clouds that you're seeing. Thank you. 
So this is a similar sort of thing to when you get to a track behind an airplane. So there's a lot of moisture in the atmosphere and it's just the exhaust, just helping those uh, drops of moisture to form together and leave that cloud. And this is a tiny little sample of the element called americium. Or this is used in smoke detection. So you've probably got some of this in your home, at least you should have. Uh, so this is an artificially produced metal and as soon as this is introduced, look at that. What we're seeing here are tracks from the alpha particles emitted from this radioactive Notice source. they don't go very far and they're thick. And these alpha particles, well, they're two protons, two neutrons, and they grab electrons and form helium atoms. So what you're seeing here are the birth of helium atoms. But you can also see the background radiation occurring. Look at these long ones. These long ones are gamma. Shorter long ones are, are um, where the, where the um, I can stop this. The shorter ones are um, uh, the beta particles. Long skinny ones are beta particles that stop and the long, 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 long ones are the gamma. Okay, so uh, interesting, I think. Anyway, I'm gonna plug myself back in and continue on our discussion here demonstration of these particles that you can actually kind of visualize them coming off. I thought that's pretty cool. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> okay. All right. I know. Same dad joke. All right. So in any case, let's move on. Okay. Now, we've been talking about, and everything I've done up to this point, we've been talking about natural transmutation. Transmutation means the nucleus is changing into another nucleus. And in natural transmutation that occurs in alpha, beta, gamma, and positron decay, these are natural events that occur that are spontaneous as we move from an unstable nucleus to a stabler one, for whatever the four reasons we've talked about. These are natural because they do not require the help of anything else. We're not inputting energy to make them happen. Okay, remember, uh, Wilhelm Rochin used energy in the Crookes tube to make the X-ray. But, okay, Henry Becquerel, with the help of Mary, um, Marie and Pierre Curie, okay, understood the phenomenon of these standalone atoms that do not, with any input of energy, give off this same phenomenon, okay? So natural transmutation is when you have a nuclear equation, this is important, that stands by itself that only has one what? Atom. And by the way, this is an example of a type of decay pattern that has a half-life that's constant. This is based upon one element okay so it's a unimolecular reaction if you want to say it's a reaction it's not really a reaction but this is first order and this is first order decay and therefore the half-life of these things stay constant okay any case these are all written as natural transmutation because i only have one reactant one thing decaying when it decays we don't know okay one atom a group of them we know the time it takes and we'll talk more about that so let's continue on We've been through all of this, and now we're going to go on to the next slide. Okay, and uh, this one will continue. This one, of course, you can do more practice. But notice every single one I'm drawing here. There is only one reactant. These are all example of natural transmutation, and the ones below on the bottom, same idea. Okay, easy enough, I would hope. Okay, if you if you didn't do the first. Uh, or weren't with me for the first lecture, then this doesn't make any sense. I'm sorry. Now we move on to artificial. That's why I'm zooming in here. Artificial means that we're going to force nuclei to change that normally wouldn't occur without a collision. So when you have artificial transmutation, we're talking about two or more, and normally we know things aren't termolecular. It's usually bimolecular, two things colliding, three things coming together. It, the chance of that just doesn't seem probable. But the point I'm trying to make here um, is that, not on that slide, is that here we have a nuclear equation where two atoms are here, which means these guys slam together. And we force that collision of nuclei 
to create a new nucleus. This is still transmutation, but it's artificial. And in order to slam nuclei together, you need energy, okay? You need energy because think about that. Not only do the electrons repel, we call that activation energy when two atoms have to exchange electrons or simultaneously share electrons, we have to get past the electrons and get into the nuclei. Well, positives and positives in a small area, Coulomb's law, you got these positives and they're in a small area. Think of, forget about an, uh, 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 an electron cloud the size of a molecule. We're talking about 10 to the negative two, okay, where the nucleus is and only a small part of that nucleus, right? So when nuclei come together, there's gonna be incredible amounts of repulsive forces. So we need to add energy in to slam them together. So here's another Curie. Here's a daughter of Marie Curie. I think there's five Nobel Prizes in the Curie family. I think she has one of them, okay? She discovered that the stable nucleus can be made unstable by bombardment of a high energy particle or a bullet. So alpha particles right here, bombarded by boron, make nitrogen, brand new element that came on that's stable, okay? Not as stable as nitrogen 14 anyway, but more stable than, well, I, I can't, well, any case, and produces a neutron. Now you say, okay, big deal. Well, actually this, um, it's called a neutron gun or a neutron bullet. This neutron being released can be fired at a fissionable material. We'll learn that a fissionable material is a very large atom that's unstable, too many what? Protons. So it's binding energy, can't really keep it together. And when you shoot a slow moving neutron, it can split into more stable or smaller forms, right? If you're above 83, yeah, you're fighting to keep the nucleus together and it can be split by a slow moving neutron. That's what fission is. And so the atomic bomb or fission bombs, where we take unstable nuclei like uranium or plutonium, and we split them into more stabler forms. Smaller what? Nuclei are not overcrowded and are more stable. Unstable nuclei above 83. And so we use this little neutron bullet as the detonator of a fission bomb. You can't take uranium or something that's fissionable. We'll talk about that. Only um, three or four, um, I may be misquoting that, but three or four not nuclear person, but uh, only three or four isotopes of elements are actually fissionable, right? So that's, a four, that's why you need plutonium, uranium. Okay, there's only a, a few different types that are fissionable. So you need to have that fuel, that enriched form of the fuel. We'll talk more about that. But in any case, um, you can't take a fissionable material and just light on fire or explode it and think that you're going to have a, a, a fission bomb or an atomic bomb. Okay, you can't do that because you need to shoot a neutron at it. So the detonation of the atomic bomb, okay, at a certain altitude dropped by Nola Gay was actually the release of slow moving neutrons that started that uncontrollable chain reaction we'll get to. But in any case, the idea that two nuclei have to come together is artificial, okay? And so the, the, the Marie, um, um, the Curie's, Marie's Curie's daughter was part of finding this important um, type of artificial transmutation. In fact, this kind of started uh, what we call um, particle accelerators or atom smashers, okay? Uh, any case, I need to go back to Ernest. Ernest, remember that guy, Ernest Rutherford? Uh, for those that don't have me in class, you don't know what I'm talking about, but in any case, uh, Ernest Rutherford, probably the, one of the greatest experimentalists of our day, okay? that Bohr worked under and he was the father of the atomic what, theory. Any case, he uh, noticed and, and put together one of the first nuclear equations where shooting alpha particles, which he loved, remember the alpha particles shot through thin gold foil or metal foils to undergo this uh, um, um, scattering effect, uh, uh, Rutherford scattering, which led him to conclude the atoms have very small nuclei that are very dense and all the protons are in it. But in any case, in his experiments, uh, alpha particles would hit the nitrogen in the air and they would make a smaller particle hydrogen, okay? And so he was actually the first to experimentally, to experimentally figure out there's a positive particle that comes out uh, and it later was called a proton. And it wasn't till H. S., uh, H. Mosley, uh, one of his students who actually died in World War I, um, figured out that every individual atom has a unique proton. All right, so any case, that's where we're heading, but notice the reaction. There are two nuclei here. In order for this to happen, 
they have to slam together. Now, the ones that I just showed you don't require a lot of energy, right? Uh, 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 this hits this and this happens. And um, this examples that I just showed you don't require a tremendous amount of e uh, energy, but most other artificial um, uh, collisions or particle to particle collisions and we require a physicality, require a piece of equipment that's going to generate energy to smash or put these nuclei together. And so we call them particle accelerators or we call them atom smashers. Okay. Now we're from Long Island. And so how can I not talk about the Brookhaven National Lab, which has something called the Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider. Okay. Very famous for the things that it found. Now there are a bunch of other colliders. Okay. But the bottom line is that we change nuclei, okay, by smashing atoms. And, and you say, well, why did we do that? Okay, why, why is there the Brookhaven National Lab, which has the relativistic heavy ion collider called the RIC? We also know that there's the Fermi Lab, that's a much older lab in Chicago area, um, that actually uh, was the home to the first nuclear uh, controlled reaction. I think um, fission reaction was done there in a squash court, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but in any case, why did we smash atoms? Well, we understood that when we smash atoms, we can actually put energy into the equation. And by smashing them, we actually come up with fundamental particles. We get smaller particles. And so we discovered something called quarks, okay? And we discovered six quarks, the up, down, charm, train, charm, strange, top, bottom. We, we understood that the protons, neutrons, electrons actually are made up of smaller particles called these quarks. So smashing particles led us to come up with smaller fundamental particles and understanding what nature is made up of. And then as we added more and more energy um, to uh, our particle to particle collisions, we got more interesting information. Remember the Big Bang Theory or the standard model, these are all physics types of theories based upon how matter behaves and also where matter came from, right? The idea that we all came, that the universe started, it's hard to grasp these understandings and I'm not anywhere near the person that should be discussing them or at least having a long winded conversation about them. But I'll give you the, the, the basics here is that a, a great amount of energy in the universe became the matter. Somehow energy became matter, okay? And that's how the start of the universe, it's called the Big Bang, okay, uh, theory. And so what's interesting about when you start adding a lot of energy into the atom smashers, physicists can peer into the future of how the universe worked. Well, wait a minute, how do they do that? Well, if you take matter that exists today and you smash it together, what you get are smaller and smaller and smaller particles. And these images that you see here, okay, uh, from the Brookhaven National Lab show these different particles that came out of them based on their light, based upon their um, way that they behave, okay, they can figure out what they are and how, and uh, when I say going back in time, remember we started with energy and we became particles. Well, if we go, if we do this opposite, take the particles and smash them, then they get into smaller particles, we can peer into what they look like before they became the current particles. Now what happens is this stuff slams, makes these tremendously amount of different things, okay? And it doesn't last very long because they recondense back into matter. So it's a small, small event with tremendous, tremendous high energy, okay? So they can actually test a little bit about the model of the beginning of the universe and how all things began and understand all matter better by peering into how they were formed by going kind of going back in time by smashing them and creating the scenario that existed micro microseconds right after the big explosion and they're able to confirm that and so the Brookhaven National Lab okay very famous today because um, it's got, a, again, the heavy ion RIC or the relativistic heavy ion collider. Relativistic just means that we can move, okay, the particles we want to smash at percentages are very close to the speed of light. The word relativistic means um, add or some proportion to the speed of light, okay? And be, matter behaves differently. And a lot of what Einstein said uh, in his special theory relativities, okay, uh, talked about how matter behaves at 
speeds of light are confirmed here. But more importantly, um, what's so special of the Brookhaven National Lab, that's only about 20 miles from our school is, it was the only, only place in the world we can actually smash atoms. Most of these, including the Fermi Lab and the CERN Lab, okay, uh, they probably can do this also, but the Brookhaven National was the first to take entire atoms and smash them. And to move an atom, and they use gold, and you know, gold has 79 protons. And the reason why we use gold is because it's got a, what, very dense nuclei. And so when you smash them, you get a lot of data. Before smashing atoms, or the nuclei, I should say, or the ions, because you can't move atoms around, I'll talk about that. Um, you have to understand that when we smashed protons, we would get data, but protons, you know, we would, the data is limited. So if we have a stronger, okay, a particle accelerator that can move these gold ions together, those collisions would give us more data. Instead of a proton to proton, you've got 79 protons and 79 protons hitting neutrons. And since all matter is made of protons, neutrons, electrons, everything else, we would get what the early universe looks like as opposed to a single proton to proton. And you'd get so much more data. So the Brookhaven National Lab was famous for its ability to have that kind of power to move these heavy gold ions and smash them um, very close to the speed of light. Okay, and it's important to do that. Now, I could talk forever about that, but I do want to play a certain movie, so I'm going to escape out of here. Uh, I'm going to stop this share, and I want to go to um, uh, another uh, share screen here. So I'm going to go share, and I'm going to go to, um, I guess I have to do that way. Maybe I don't um, escape this out, and I wanted to go to Brookhaven National Lab. I think I have this up, and uh, I want to play this little movie. It's very short, okay, unlike me, but I want to talk about how cool this place is if you haven't been there. Okay, so any case, here it goes. Where I grew up in the mountains outside of Portland, Oregon, I could look up in the sky and see thousands and thousands of stars in the night sky. And I would wonder, where did all this come from? I find it amazing that I can rewind the clock and go back and look at what existed in the universe before any of those stars were even created. And we can recreate the conditions of the early universe, and we can study the force that holds together that matter. I guess V-necks are cool at Brookhaven National Lab, I'm not really sure. Okay. As well as all of the matter that exists in the visible universe today. I'm Paul Sorensen. We're in the main control room of the Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider and Atom Smasher at Brookhaven National Now, this is the ring. I believe it's a three-mile ring. And it's underground because you don't want to have cosmic rays and any other types of things to affect the collider. What's interesting about the collider is that um, it was built on older colliders. That's really cool about the Brookhaven National Lab is that to get speeds up to the speed of light to move these heavy ions, and it's a small amount, but they're still heavy as compared to protons. What they did is took the older um, um, particle accelerator, they had, I think, three other older particle accelerators that were using, obviously, of low energy, and they connected, they connected them, okay? Um, and that connection of the older ones to the new gave the boost for the main ring now to do its work. National Lab. From this room, we steer ions. There it is. So there's a um, Van de Graaff accelerator to show that. This goes to the asynchronous uh, one. That's, this one actually has two or three Nobel Prizes on it. So there's an older Van de Graaff, that, they didn't show that, that pumps into the, um, I forget the exact name of this one, of this ring that's a little older, okay, that was doing some work. And then the boost from this older one, Van de Graaff one, to this asynchronous one. And this one gives it the boost before it goes into the, 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 the rick. So there's older, they, kind of, they use the older technology to boost up the speed of these uh, ions, and that's what gives Rick its, its, its unique ability to move something as heavy the speed of light. ...runs around a 2.5 mile circular track and smash them together at nearly the speed of light. And notice the ring was going in opposite direction until they smashed them. And these are, the, these are, of course, the gold ions. And it's important to recognize and it's important to know for regions chemistry is that you cannot accelerate atoms. When I say atom, you say neutral. And so what moves these guys essentially are electromagnets, 
right? So what we have in a tube is we have incredible amounts of magnets. So you have to have something positive or negative. So in this case, we have gold ions, which are positive. And so if we wanna move this ion forward, we make this electromagnet negative, right? And so it moves forward, positive attract negatives. Now, as it moves past this, this magnet now becomes positive, so it repels, and the magnets in front become what? Negative, and that's how we accelerate and move these guys. So computers and electromagnets, okay, do this. This would not work, okay? You cannot accelerate a neutron, you can't accelerate atoms. You have to have charged particles, okay? Because moving charged particles create a magnetic field and you could play with that field to attract or push or those kind of things them forward. And that's important. When we collide the ions, it creates a fireball that only exists for one billionth of one billionth of one millionth of a second. A very, very brief amount of time. And the fireball is only one billionth of one millionth of a meter across. This is a very short-lived and a very small speck of matter. But with the detectors that we have, we can... Okay, look at the size of the person here. There's a person, okay? And so this stuff is happening in a small, tiny little tube. And look at these detectors. They're huge. Sometimes some of these detectors are three or four stories tall, okay, around one of those collisions. And those detectors are looking for different things. I can play this, maybe. Look at all of the remnants that come flying out from those collisions. And we can trace them back and then look at the patterns of how they come out to try to understand what the matter was like that created all of them. One of the most amazing things that we've discovered at Rick is that this matter that we recreate is very much like a liquid as opposed to a gas, which many people thought it would behave like before. So it's amazing that this matter, which is 250,000 times hotter than the center of the sun, actually behaves a lot like a liquid. This now that was a major, major find. Okay, remember, nobody ever smashed so much uh, particles together. Colliding, uh, uh, having the power that the Rick had, that no other collider at the time had, okay, gave us something that we never expected to happen. Colliding so many neutrons and protons and so much data, we expected that the quarks and gluons, neutrons and whatever particles, neutrinos, whatever other, you know, pieces of particles there, um, would became, behave like a gas. It's four trillion degrees in those little collisions. Well, things with that kind of kinetic energy are gases, but these particles stuck together like what? Like a, a hot quark gluon soup. They stuck together. There was some kind of force of attraction there. And that led us to believe that there's things going on that we did not expect, okay? And I'll let them talk a little more, but this opened the door for other particle accelerators. So uh, there is certainly more to this, what they discovered than I am touching on. I'm just a layman's view of what's going on here. Remember, there's many, many different experiments. What's interesting about these particle accelerators, they run the experiment, then for nine months later, they're still looking at data to figure out what's going on. So they run this experiment, but it takes maybe up to a year or three quarters of a year sometimes to discern what exactly went on when they trace every single particle. But no matter what we found from the RIC, most important, one of the most important things is there's asymmetry. There's, you don't expect to be that hot and stick together. Well, why are they sticking together? Why is the early universe not a gas? Why did it stick together? Well, there must be something at play here, okay? And that's where we kind of move toward that Higgs boson theory, but I'll, I'll continue here. This is what the early universe was behaving like. So we're really peering back and looking at that. This fundamental research brings together some of the smartest people in the world to try to solve some very difficult technological problems. How do you accelerate these gold nuclear- Right, so there's the two, right? So there's the two with electromagnets, I think, inside, and that's the, that's the ring. That's, it's below ground, kind of cool, okay, if you've never been to this Brookhaven National Lab. For example, up to such high energies, how do you detect what's coming out from all of the collisions? How do you analyze all the data that's coming out? This leads to advances in superconducting magnets. It leads to advances in detector technology, and it leads to advances in computing. This is also where the next generation of scientists will be trained. And who knows what they're going to go off and do and discover with the knowledge that they've gained at Rick. Okay. Um, 
so what the Rick um, opened the door for was that there was some of some asymmetry. Now the asymmetry I'm talking about is it didn't expand out, okay, like a gas, even though it looks like that here. It, it stayed together as a cork glue on soup. And why was it sticking together? Well, remember, as soon as you blow these guys up, eventually in a small second, they reform back to some particles. So there must be some particles in there helping transform these particles from energy back to mass. What we're doing in particle accelerators by peering into the past of what the early universe does, we're adding energy to make particles. But those particles, okay, okay, convert back or that those smaller particles reform and release the energy back somehow. There's, a, there's energy going back into matter, matter back into energy. So this kind of asymmetrical kind of sticking together that was going on led us to believe that there's other particles at play helping us go from energy to particles and particles to energy. And that's where the Higgs field or Higgs boson comes in. They didn't discover it, but part of what they discovered led them to believe that their earlier models of the universe were confirmed. And this 1960 idea that there's a Higgs field, that when something goes through that field and affected by that field, gives it its mass. Energy can be converted to mass by these bosons. And Higgs was one of the scientists who proposed that when he was working with the mathematics of one of the models of the universe. I'm not, um, you know, understanding of all of that, okay, as a chemist. All right, so any case, let's continue on. We're not gonna go too much further, but um, so these are nice reactions. These are nice little videos that go through what's happening, okay, at the, um, the, um, the, the Rick, okay. And then of course, what made big news in the uh, early 200s or later to 2008, I guess, is the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, which was on the France Switzerland border. I don't know how many billions of dollars is used to build this huge collider. This huge collider was using more energy to get proton-proton collisions. And with this tremendous amount of energy that this collider can provide, notice how, how small that person is right there compared to the tubes and the magnets and the energy used, um, they could actually come up with traces of where these particles responsible for converting energy to matter, matter energy, and uh, they were able to find what they called the God particle, the particle that created mass. Remember, we started as energy and all of a sudden we're matter. How'd that happen? Well, the idea through the mathematics of either the standard model, the Big Bang, and again, I'm not um, versed enough to, to, to go into there, uh, said there's a particle responsible in that conversion of energy to mass and mass to energy, and that's called the boson, the Higgs boson. And so this collider actually proved that there is that particle. Now the proof, they couldn't find the particle, but they found traces of, of it being there, right? they're, they're the remnants of where it would be, so to speak. And there's a bunch of movies there to go into that. All right, and I'm not gonna go and talk about all of that. That's just another course for another day, but just be aware that's the stuff you hear about. And so people say, why don't we spend billions of dollars to find a particle that's not gonna feed more people? I get those arguments. But if we can understand how matter okay, uh, exists and, and understand the fundamental particles that make all matter, and we can somehow control our, our matter a little bit better, think about a particle and understanding, and I don't say, I don't know if this is even possible, but if we can understand the things that help convert matter to energy and energy to matter, boy, could you see how amazing that might be for our Earth? Okay, think about it. If I took a glass of water and converted all the energy of the water, every single atom of energy, we could run New York City for 80 years in a glass of water, okay? And so think about that. So there is, and by the way, with clean, 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 um, uh, with, no, with no after effects of, of nuclear waste or, or anything like that. So not burning fossil fuels, okay? We're not putting up ugly wind farms that people don't like on our coast, but you know, obviously that's renewable resource to win. But the point is, can you imagine being able to harness and harnessing that energy? Okay, right now the world runs on fossil fuels. Okay, and you know, uh, eventually we're going to run out. So, uh, so understanding how to better uh, do that in our environment is important. Okay, so last little piece here: natural versus artificial. You can see that obviously um, beta, alpha, and positron only have one reactant. Okay. 
um, because they are by themselves trying to fix themselves. Whereas this one right here has two reactants and that's an example of artificial. We have to slam them together. And I also like to think about it this way. I mean, in artificial transmutation, it's artificial because of this. If I wanted to walk out of my house or I don't, I don't have a stream, but if I had a nice, you know, pretty uh, field and I walk through that field and there's wildflowers and I walk past that into this beautiful um, babbling brook and a creek and I step over that and the fish are jumping and then I go through a grove of, of natural, um, I don't know, fruit trees if that's a thing, <laughs> okay, and I'm in this beautiful natural environment and all of a sudden I see a tree with a particle accelerator. <laughs> that, doesn't exa that doesn't make any sense, right? Particle accelerants aren't natural. We have to build them to uh, create the energy to slam these guys together. That's artificial. Uh, maybe you didn't need that visual. Okay, so um, here is a question that I omitted. If you notice, number three, which equation represents a nuclear reaction? It's an example of artificial. Obviously, you've got to slam two atoms together with a machine, and obviously that's choice two. Okay, so we're gonna pick up Half-Life uh, Tuesday, and uh, so Tuesday into uh, the rest of the next, last week, of nuclear chem will stop here. There will be an assignment posted by Monday that includes everything that I've talked about in the first two lectures. Okay, so I'm gonna stop my share and hopefully you enjoyed a second of that. And if not, too bad. So uh, 13 are now with me. Okay, so we'll see you next time. Have a great weekend, stay safe and make sure if you got something outstanding, okay, get that into me. All right, we'll miss you guys. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye, someone say bye. 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 <laughs> <laughs>